Hi, welcome. My name is Tiffany Herr from Hughes of Africa, and I am excited to have our guest on today. And we're going to be talking about traveling. Um, I never really like to use the words traveling at an older age. So, Diamond, what would you call it? What, what would you? What's the word I should use? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, Tiffany, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, your words of inspiration and encouragement around business on Facebook are just, you know, fabulous. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And since you did ask the question, thank you. We don't use older, we use seasoned, baby. We seasoned. That's that's of course, as we're recording, I, I for I forgot the word. <laughs> So I love when people help me out. So yes, we are going to be talking about um, about being a seasoned traveler. Um, I feel like it's super, super important to do that. But before we get into the discussion, I'm going to go ahead and let Diamond uh, tell us about who she is before we get into the meat of things. So Diamond. All right. Thanks again. Yes, I am Diamond Crystal. On Facebook, you will find me as Diamond Brand New Crystal because I had to recreate my Facebook profile once I lost my iPhone in uh, Mexico about a year ago. Um, so yes, find me on Facebook as Diamond Crystal. And I am a travel ambassador and global nomad for women, Black women over 55 who are looking to do international travel and embrace a new life of ease and freedom. I love that. Um, and you know, the reason why I love that is because my mom is over 55. She probably won't oh. tell that, but she is. And she will actually be going with me for the first time on an international trip. And I'm so excited to have her. Yes. I've been trying to get her to go for forever. So I cannot wait to take her. And I honestly really think that is going to be a life changing trip for her. Mm -hmm. Um plug really quickly you all can join us on that trip to ghana we're going to ghana west africa um december um 28th and we are bringing in the new year in ghana um but i mentioned that caveat because i almost feel like it's going to literally bring me to tears to have her on this trip with me um it's a difference of me telling you about something and it's a difference of her being able to experience it um and as many stories as i tell her once she stepped foot on ground in Ghana is just going to be completely life changing for her. And I really believe that. And we still got six months to go. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> so I am super excited to have you on um, because we are talking about solo traveling. And I want to know when did you start actually solo traveling? At what age did you dive deep into it? Because sometimes people feel like it's too late, right? You hear that phrase, it's too late for me to do this, it's too late for me to do that. And of course, it's never too late, but sometimes we are in that mental capacity of thinking that because of a certain age, if we haven't gotten married, which we ain't even talking about that, or if we haven't gotten a degree, or if we haven't gotten this, um, age seems to be a factor. So when did you start solo traveling? Well, I started solo traveling um, at 58. And I started as part of a wellness um, sabbatical, so to speak. So I had gone through a divorce um, and my first solo trip, I took myself to Belize for 10 days. And I'll tell anybody, I chose Belize because it's tropical and you know, it was kind of sexy, but the main reason was because I didn't have to learn a new language to go there. So you talked a little bit about fear and trepidation. That was one of those factors that played into my selection in um, my first my first solo uh, travel experience. But since then, I have been worldwide. Me and Google Translate are real good friends, Duolingo. So <laughs> no such thing as too late, too old. It's just that you ju you got to get that passport and get some stamps in it. So I'm 58. Exactly, exactly. So that's funny because I was just about to mention Google Translate. You know, we our technology is getting better and better. If this was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I may be scared, but I'm like, go ahead and down that Google Translate and make sure you download that offline version, y'all. Because don't, oh, don't, get, um, what was that? Uh, Cuba. I was in Cuba and forgot to turn the offline. I don't know if you've been to Cuba, but their internet is wonky, it's crazy. So I wasn't even able to use it, but it surprised me how much Spanish I knew. 
Um, yeah. But this is this. These are the things that we want to break down to let people know that it shouldn't be a fear. If you chose that one because of um, the language thing. But now we're going to get into more. We're going to talk about some other des destinations you've been to where you don't know the language and you, yes. went, you went forward with it. Um, so that's super, super exciting. I have not been to Belize yet, so I'm sure that is Belize is a wonderful place and it's definitely on my list of places to go. Yeah. Um, so where else have you been um, on your solo travels? All right. So once I got my sea legs, so to speak, um, with that adventure in um, Belize, I got very, very serious about doing house sitting um, full time. Um, so my first adventure... Uh, was to Ecuador. And that wasn't a house sitting um, assignment. It was part, again, of this whole wellness sabbatical that I allowed myself to take. At the time, I was gainfully employed. Um, my employer had given me a full 60 days um, at, you know, on the heels of losing both my parents very unexpectedly. So I, mm -hmm. I needed this time off. Um, and she recognized that. So I went with, you know, all the blessings in the world, 60 days. Listen, I could do it. I'll be back and better than ever. Well, girl, day 50 rolled around and I was having anxiety. Like, I, I can't come back. Right. I'm not ready to come back. And so at that point, I, um, I found a long-term sit in Mexico. And it's just been rolling fast forward ever since. Okay, so I there are a couple terms that you mentioned that our guests may not even know what they are. So I'm gonna have you explain it. Um, one of them is what exactly is a wellness sabbatical, and then the second one, what is house sitting? Okay, so wellness sabbatical. Um, I will describe it in my own terms because I don't think that there's really you know a Webster's def definition for it. To be honest with you, when I first came across the term sabbatical. It was something I was familiar with from the education um, field. You know, teachers or um, clergy people will take a break, a sabbatical, to learn and to delve um, more into themselves um, outside of, you know, their everyday practices or, um, you know, uh, what they do every day for a living. They take a break. And so that's what I did. I took a break, but mine was a wellness break. I really needed to do some healing and some introspective kind of work. So that's why I coined it my wellness sabbatical. And again, I thought 60 days was more than enough. It had not even begun to scratch the surface. And so you, so I want to give a shout out to your supervisor because you said that she recognized what you needed and she approved, right? Yes. We in America are almost like in this rat race, right? It's like, how long can we work? How long can we not take our two weeks vacation time that we only get? Um, right. So the fact that she allowed you 60 days to me was a sign that uh, I was, and I don't know her personally, so you can correct me, um, but maybe that she cares for her team, right? Um, in a sense that she allows you to go for 60 days, right? We won't even talk, we won't touch on some other stuff. But the point is she allowed you to do that. And I wish more supervisors recognize that sometimes we need that break. And maybe in your case, you didn't. But another thing is that sometimes when we take that break, we are ready to come back full first, full force and be uh, do the things that we need to do. But sometimes we need that break. Um, Absolutely. I am very grateful that I had a, a supportive supervisor at that time. Um, you know, I was in a very stressful position as a corporate event planner. So that was, you know, dot all the I's, cross all the T's and then do it three, four times to make sure nothing falls. Um, and I was starting to drop some balls, which was uncharacteristic of me in my professional capacity. So my boss was like, hey, talk to me. What's going on? And I said to her, I'm struggling. And it was those, those two words, I'm struggling. Um, and just, I think the transparency um, that I was able to um, you know, bring forth with her and really just tell her what was going on in my life. And she's like, well, how can I support her? So yes, kudos to my ex-supervisor. We parted on very good terms. I just, I couldn't come back. I wasn't ready. Right. And I think the other important thing is sometimes, what do they say? Uh, closed mouth, don't get fed. I right. think sometimes we need to speak up. We may be scared. Oh, I don't know if they're going to prove it. I don't, but you don't know unless you ask, right? So I think it's very important for us to, 
I don't care if we got to ask, draft a letter, send an email. I think it's important to at least bring up the topic and see what they say, because they may just say yes. And so I think that's super, super important. Um, and I think it's important for us to take the time that we need, whether it's a sabbatical, a vacation, whatever you want to call it. Like you said, you coined your own word. Um, and then I think touching on, you also talked about, um, it sounds like grief too, because you said you had lost your parents. Yeah, there was yeah. a lot of stuff going on. And you mentioned the word healing. I think we don't mention the word healing a lot. I think we often are going through lots of trauma. And sometimes we just keep going without actually stopping to kind of tend to, hey, what is going on? And if I know what's going on, how can I grieve more properly? A lot of times we don't grieve. We go, how much do you, how much do, does, do you get time off for um, a death in the family? I don't even know if it's a week at this point. You know what I'm right. saying? And, and you never really get over, especially close loved ones, you never really get over that. You just kind of learn how to deal with it, you know? Um, and so I think that healing is definitely important. I'm glad you kind of recognize it and said, this is what I need. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's a matter of having to be brutally honest with yourself because, you know, if you are a working black woman and you need to support yourself and your, and, or your family, you are taking into consideration all the things you just said. I only get this much time. I can only afford to be gone this much time. Right. So um, we are not allowing ourselves the rest, the recuperation, the the grieving process itself can be so heavy. Um, and so I knew, you know, my mom was my best friend. Uh, cancer one, which was not a surprise bar. I will tell anybody barring a miracle from heaven. Um, you know, cancer was going to win that battle. Right. Mm -hmm. But. 23 days after my mom left this world, my father just laid down and died. So mm -hmm. it was, it was compound grief and trauma, you know, and I'm still trying to process all this stuff and go to work every day. Right, right, right. It just wasn't. So do, do you think that he passed? Do you think it was a, a broken heart? You know, that's the only thing that I can attribute it to because, you know, as an older black man, he had, you know, those typical type of health issues, um, but they were managed, high blood pressure, diabetes. It was nothing that was life threatening. So I have to say yes, you know, and the fact that he said to me, I just don't know how to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the conversation that we had. And no matter how I, you know, tried to team us up, like, hey, we're going to get through this together. He didn't know how to do it without her at that point. So you know, they had been married for how many years? They have been together quite a long time. They were high, junior high school sweethearts. Mm, okay, okay. So, yeah. So when you're so used to somebody being around, I've heard that that has happened on many occasions where one goes and then the other one goes soon after. Um, yeah. Like you said, they just don't know how to handle it. And yeah. then you as the daughter, here you go. Now I'm losing like, both. Right. Before you can't even, and again, remember, we never really get over it, but to have no. to deal with both, that's a lot for yeah. sure. 23 days was, it was just too much for me to handle. And like I said, Tiffany, you know, I, I felt like I was superwoman. I could do anything that I needed to do, but I needed to heal. That was a priority at that point. Exactly. And I, I think like we, I think that's important to talk about black women we take on the world and we think yep. that we can handle the world. And to a certain extent, maybe we can, but to a certain extent, we can't. Right. Um, and I think that's the part that we have to recognize. We have to recognize when we need to just sit down. Yes. We need to just go lay down. We need to just go rest. We need to just go take that vacation. Um, and it's okay not to be strong for everybody and everything around you. Sometimes you you want somebody to take care of stuff for you. <laughs> when do I get a chance to relax? You, you know, I don't I don't want to deal with nothing. Okay, you handle it. You because honestly, when you say no, you can't do it. I bet you people will figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, that was my profession, right? So corporate event planning. You do it all. You're responsible for the success, the failure, you know, the entire show belongs to you and is on your shoulders, right? Um, and on top of that, again, I had come out of a long-term marriage where I had a support partner. 
So now I was navigating life by myself as an older, as a seasoned um, <laughs> at that point. And, you know, that wasn't part of the game plan either. So it was like you juggle, but in the juggling, you're doing a good job of it. But that don't mean it's not heavy. Just because you're managing it well does not mean it's not heavy. And when you start to feel the weight of it, you have to give yourself permission to pause. Whatever that means in your life, just pause. Exactly. So, y'all, we got a little off topic, but I think it's okay that we explore these different um, topics that we're exploring because it all ties in together. Um, Okay, so... Talk to us about what exactly is house sitting. People hear the term, but they may not know exactly what it is. Right. Well, it is exactly what it sounds like. You are sitting in someone's home while they are traveling for whatever reason. Um, Nine times out of 10, you are not just caring and making sure that the home is lived in and secure on a daily basis you know, the trash, et cetera, is taken out, but you are also responsible for their fur babies. So, you know, nine times out of 10, you have pet responsibility. So it should be called house slash pet sitting because right. that's what you're doing. <laughs> you are caring for this person's entire home and their pet while they're gone. And okay, so I'm not the biggest pet person, okay? Uh-huh. So as a person like me, should I be signing up for a house sitting or is it mainly pets involved to where I, I would need to uh, really love pets in order to do the house sitting? Well, you know, I would say that you would have to tackle house sitting and pet sitting um, very honestly with yourself. If you are not an animal person, this is probably not going to be the best um, method for you to use to travel the world. Uh, So be honest with yourself, because while there are some house sits that do not require the care of a pet, they are very few and far between. They're Mm -hmm. like the golden nugget. Everybody is going for them. And, you know, you you probably are not going to have the level of success that you are looking for. And what types of animals have you seen with your uh, house sitting? Well, you know, I've seen a whole litany of different types of pets that you can apply for personally i do domestic animals cats and dogs period okay (laughs) no reptiles i don't do bunnies none of that stuff cats that's it you like cats and dogs that's it so is there a possibility has there been like one for fishes or turtles or any of those Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, You know, but again, they are few and far between, right? Because uh, most people don't have just fish unless it's, you know, maybe koi fish or something in the backyard. And then even at that, you have to have some level of experience because they're very expensive uh, fish that you would be caring for, right? So you got to be honest with yourself. Can I actually do this? And should I be applying for this to be successful? Right. Okay. That's good. Um, so technically I ain't everyday house sitting, but technically, yeah. you know, I've had to watch dogs for my aunt. She had, she was like, can you watch the dog? I was like, Oh Lord. <laughs> it was a, it's a cocker. Sp- well, he passed away now. So but it's a cocker spaniel. So it wasn't too bad. So I was like, okay, maybe I can do this. Um, at one point he didn't want to go outside. So I called her. I was like, uh, what do I do? I'm like, should I drag him? Because he was just like, I ain't leaving. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, okay. Tell me one of your funniest house petting stories or tell me one of the worst, whatever you want to tell me. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I have to tell you that I have really been blessed on this journey. So okay. I don't have, I don't have any one particular horror story at all. Um, but I will say that sometimes the hosts, the people, the two-legged hosts, as opposed to the four-legged hosts, are a bit more challenging, right? I'm um, sure. So go in, you're going in, and I try to do 30 days at a time when I'm by myself. Okay. So I'm not packing and unpacking a lot, right? Um, generally, they will ask you, you know, what do you like to eat? Can we stop the fridge for you? Can we, you know, leave you a gift card so, you know, you can go to the, the local supermarket, whatever the case may be, just being gracious and courteous, right? I had one host who cleaned out everything, just like nothing was left in the fridge, no milk, no nothing, nothing to eat. First day that you arrived, this was in Panama. 
And as I opened the cabinets, everything was labeled. Do not touch. Do not touch. Do yeah. not touch. Do not touch. So that kind of left a um, sour not taste. Pleasant, not, <laughs> not so pleasant taste in my mouth, right? And I'm going to be there for 35 days. So the first day I do have to call Uber Eats, whatever. Not a problem, but still, again, unexpected and non-traditional. Um, and, and then the pet, I was in a high rise. The pet was an older pet who needed to go out on a more frequent basis than what I had experienced. Um, so those two together made that sit more challenging. Right. What made it worth it was I was in a penthouse in the middle of Panama City in one of the best areas there for 35 days. So, you know, it's a balancing act. You take the good with the bad. Could I have afforded to stay in that building for that amount of time? Um on my own, yeah. Huh. Would it have stretched my budget? Yeah. Right. So it was worth it to me. Exactly. So okay, so that's a good point. And so do you do they pay you or are you just receiving the free accommodation? So it is strictly if you're using trusted house sitters, I will give you that um disclaimer. If you are using that service, which many of the ladies are, um, then it is strictly an exchange of accommodations for services. Okay. So if you are looking for uh, accommodations that you don't have to pay for, then it's a wonderful way for you to save money, stretch your dollars, be able to spend it on what you want to spend it on as opposed to, you know, room and board. Okay. So, and, and that's a, and that's a good way. So that's a good segue into our solo travel um, so talk about some of the, and I hate asking this question because people ask me this and I never know how to answer it. Uh, like what has been your favorite solo destination uh, thus far? Well, uh, if anybody has read my blog or follows me on Facebook or anything in social media, y'all know that, you know, Ecuador has my heart. It was the first place that I went to. That was my 60 day healing sabbatical. I really got, I started the, the important work there and I got what I needed to, um, I say, move forward confidently um, as a solo traveler. So uh, it was supposed to be 60 days. It wound up being 83 days uh, in Monta, Ecuador. It was oceanfront. I go back and reset my year every year there because I just get what I need there. So while I've been a whole host of other places, Monta Ecuador still has my heart. And I feel I, those types of trips, I'm pretty sure. And I'm glad to hear Ecuador because I don't hear a lot of people mention Ecuador. And when you talk about wellness and healing, that's not mentioned. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. You mm -hmm. hear places like Bali or, you know, stuff like that. So I'm glad to hear that there are other countries that, you know, provide that healing and stuff for other people as well. Yeah. Um, and so for solo travel, um, what is some advice that you would give to women who are seasoned that have never done it before and want to try now? Um, my first piece of advice is to put your faith over your fear and move forward. You know, you're going to stay in that same um, level or space of trepidation and anxiety until you actually walk out on faith and do it. So when you said your mother was finally doing her first solo travel experience, trust me, you ain't going to be able to keep up with her when she get finished with that. Because <laughs> it empowers you, particularly if you have not ever traveled outside of a family setting, a couple setting, always being with someone who could kind of help you navigate. It's going to empower you to the point where you start trusting and believing in your instincts. You have to because you have no one else to rely on. So that within itself is empowering. So that's my first piece of advice. Put your faith over your fear. Get that passport ready and book the trip. Right. That's that's what I say. I say we're going to use Nike slogan like just do it. Right. I think because it's easy to talk about it. But until you get out there and do it, then you may not ever do it. Right. And yep. is it scary? Absolutely. But do we do stuff when we're scared? Yep. Because those yep. feelings, I want to acknowledge those feelings. It's okay. Like you, <laughs> let's sit in those feelings. But once you sit in those feelings, let's keep it moving. What is the next step that we have to do, right? 
that. Um, like you said, getting that passport. That is like the basic thing that you can get. So That's go right. ahead and get that and then go ahead and book that trip. Where are you going? What destination are you going to? And a, another thing with, with solo travel, I find a lot of people feel like they're going to be alone. Do you feel like you're alone when you're solo traveling? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, and I will say kudos to each one of the Facebook groups that are out there that create a soft landing and a sense of community. When I arrived in Ecuador, um, this, like I said, was really my first extended trip. I didn't, I didn't arrive alone. You know, the person who picked me up from the airport and drove me to my accommodations was someone I had already been uh, referred to and had spoken to on, on different occasions, right? So it wasn't like catch an Uber and get there the best way you know how. Once I got there, you know, there was a sister girl who runs the, um, the African-American group on Facebook who helped me find my condo. Okay. She was there to greet me. Um, and then when I decided that I wanted to be social, that entire community, which was virtual until I arrived, they now my family. So I don't feel like I'm ever alone. You can be as alone or as involved with the local uh, communities as you choose to be. So that's important. Let's talk about the Facebook group. So if anybody know me, I'm addicted to Facebook. I know, I know. <laughs> and so, but the reason why, and it was funny because I was on a call the other night. So I was like, yeah, uh, Facebook is Tiffany Jam. She always be on air. She has her coming. I said, absolutely. I said, because, and it's funny too, because when I go do presentations at high schools and junior highs, they think Facebook is for old people. I say, listen, I ain't old, okay? And I still use Facebook, right? right. Um, and so the reason why I love Facebook is because there are, I don't care, there's probably millions of groups on Facebook. Yeah. You can find a Facebook group for people with left hand. You can find a Facebook group with people that have glasses. So there is a group for anybody and everybody. And within the travel community, like you said, they have specific groups for African Americans um, in China, African Americans here, or they'll say black in China or black in here or whatever the case is. And like you said, um, finding those groups and contacting them before you get out there, you've already established some type of relationship. So you don't feel super alone when you arrive. And most people want that community while they're there anyway, because sometimes, and we could probably get into that conversation too, um, but yeah, we, we, our family is back home or maybe we don't. So we want a sense of somebody that looks like us. Right. Um, and so, and that's why it's important. I Where did we go? Um, uh, what was it? Thailand, which is funny, which is, we haven't mentioned her yet. Um, but the, where I met Stephanie at was in Thailand. <laughs> um, and she was actually taking a sabbatical at that time. So, um, you're like, you all like, who is Stephanie? Um, so that, I'll let you mention who Stephanie is because um, that kind of started your road. So we'll, let, let's take a little portion to mention who she is and then we'll keep going. All right. Well, you know, you can't even mention black women house sitting without talking about the goat, which is who is Stephanie Perry. I mean, Stephanie, I have put it on her Facebook page and I will say it here. Representation matters mm -hmm. because before you know, I saw somebody who looked like me doing something that I thought was a majority type of activity, um, you know, and I also thought it was for young folks who were kind of in between, do I want to be an adult or do I want to stay a teenager? I really never saw myself as a global house sitter. So seeing Stephanie Perry make that, um, show us that through her representation was very important. So I, you know, me and Stephanie, we sat at my mom's chemo um, sessions every week. You know, mom was doing what she needed to do. She's listening to what's going to, you know, keep her in her Zen space while this is going on. And I'm like, dang, this girl is going everywhere. You got my attention when you said you didn't pay rent for over a year. How you do that? Right. So, yeah, yeah. Let so, me know what that is. So when I say yeah, it's a small word, this is what I mean about Facebook and community. Um, I think the same thing happened when I was going, me and my cousin were going to Thailand 
I reached out and was like, hey, does anybody want to meet up? And so yeah. Stephanie was one of those ones like, like, yeah, let's have dinner. So we had dinner with her. Um, and then we and we're like, oh, we're going to go home. And somebody, another black guy rode up uh, on a motorcycle was like, where y'all going? We was like, well, we're going home. We don't know where else to go. And he was like, come out with me. So we went to like a karaoke and something after that. And you know what? When we were on that trip, he goes, he goes, let me show y'all something. So we're thinking he's about to show us something spectacular. And he just takes us outside. He just does like opens his arms. I'm like, okay, what are we looking at? He was yeah. like, y'all, we are in Thailand. We wow. are black people in Thailand, blah, blah, blah. And like, we're just randomly kind of meeting together. But I'm realizing every time I say random, nothing is ever random. No. And I say that because Stephanie went on to be my accountability partner. Uh, which Diamond didn't know that until uh, a couple minutes ago, <laughs> but yeah. she became my uh, accountability partner and I saw what she was doing and she was on that sabbatical while she was in Thailand. So yeah. when I say six degrees of separation are such a small world, there you have it. <laughs> very small world. And, you know, I get such satisfaction in meeting women who I've only known through Facebook, you know, virtual friends. So when I started house sitting, I would put it out there like I still do. I'm like, yo, I'm coming to California. Who wants to meet up? I'm coming to Seattle. Who wants to meet up? Because I started kind of, you know, reaching out that way domestically. And then when it was time for me to go international out of the country, those those relationships became vitally important to me. You know, like I said, you need to set yourself up for success wherever you're going. So providing a soft landing is what those groups have done for me and what I try to do for other people through my groups. Right. So, OK, my other question, because you mentioned global nomads. So the question people will always ask, are you working? Because we know you get the house sitting for free, but you still got to pay for other expenses. So are you currently working now or you are not, no longer working? Yes. So the answer is yes and no. I retired myself, semi-retired. Mm -hmm. um, so God willing, I will be 61 next month. Not quite social security age, but um, I do virtual assistant work. I have two clients that I work on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday only, period, in the story. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I have a long weekend every weekend. Um and I also do consult with women who are looking to start house sitting and do it successfully. So I hope that I help them to build a strategy. And for that service, there is a fee. Okay. okay, okay. And then what is VA? What is VA for those that don't know? A virtual assistant. Um, so. And, and so do you feel like with your global nomad or... Because you you learned about housing and now you're kind of paying it forward, but of course, you know, charging for your knowledge. So if people are like, hey, I don't know what to do, what would be your advice for those people that say, like, I want to take a sabbatical or I want to go off for a year? But, you know, some people are just kind of tied to their job. So what would you advise somebody in that case um, who wants to do what you're doing, but just really don't know how to do it? Well, if you're still gainfully employed, just have the conversation. Find out whether or not remote work is an option for you. Um, while I was employed, I was employed virtually. So, you know, unless it was at the convention center or at the hotel where the actual event was taking place, um, all of the planning and execution was done virtually. I did not have to come into the office. So when COVID hit, I was already used to working from home. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, can you work from home internationally? Um, that's a conversation that you really need to have with your employer, because if that's not part of the game plan, then your job could be in jeopardy. So my, my, my answer would be have the conversation and ask the question. Right, exactly. So, yeah, no, you that's a good point, too, because sometimes there's like laws or policy with your job and you've been out of the country and different things like that. So yes, you definitely have to have that conversation to see if it is okay. And then the other thing I would say in terms of just like entrepreneur, different things like that, um, there are ways to always say that if you know something really well, you can have a job, right? Um, and so I feel like sometimes, or even the stuff that we've always wanted to do, if we want to turn some of those passions 
into um, entrepreneurship or, or making money, then that's a possibility as well. So I'm like, sit down. What can you do well? What can you do well from your computer? Or again, what can you do well that can translate into money to fund this lifestyle that you want to do? And that's that's going long term. But if you just want to take that short term, there may be easier steps to do that, right? Um, so I'm glad that you've been able to kind of pivot and again, take that knowledge and um, making sure that um, you are also helping other people along the way, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's important. Somebody helped you, so you want to bring others as well. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, and then, you know, I'm a big proponent of if you talk about it, get paid for it. And I know you know what I'm talking about, Tiffany, because you get paid to travel. You like to travel. You talk about it on Facebook and it puts money in your pocket. So if you're going to spend your time talking about something, find a way to monetize it because you're doing it anyway. So I say, you know, maybe you should try this particular product. Trust and believe if I got a link out there, that link is monetized as an affiliate. So there are many, many different ways that you can um, monetize the activities that you're already doing and find new ways, like you said, to monetize your passion. Absolutely. And you mentioned affiliate links. So for people that don't know what affiliate links are, let's say you, let's say I'm just going to use a random example. Let's say you love Doritos. Okay. And you didn't partner with the Dorito brand. So now when you post about eating your chips online, you're going to put that referral link and be like, buy your chips right here. And every time somebody click on that link and either purchases or click, then you can get money from that. So that is what affiliate links are. And people can put them on their social media, on their blogs, anywhere um, there's a link to be clickable, you can put that on there. So we're just saying Talk that. About there are... it. What'd you say? Say it again. Talk about it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so let's get back to some of the destinations. So what are your top three destinations that you recommend for solo travelers? Well, I would say, you know, I- I can't say top three des- destinations because if you have not started yet, then perhaps you want to start domestically. And I say that to anybody, you know, you don't have to go outside the country to have a solo travel experience. If you have never been to New York and you always wanted to go to New York, then book a trip to New York and go by yourself. If you always wanted to go to Hollywood, book that solo trip to Hollywood, and go to California, get your um, confidence level up with doing domestic travel, you don't have the um, additional challenge of learning a new language, right? So you build up your confidence, you trust your instincts, you're empowered to now do this on your own. Then maybe you break out that blue book and get your first stamp. Mexico is a good place to go. Lot of expats, black expats in Mexico. Mexico is a great place to start and give yourself a soft landing and a really great solo experience. Um, yes, I agree with the domestic travel first. I feel like sometimes we need to get our feet wet. Now you can take the bigger leap, but like you said, if you're just starting out, you want to try. We have 50 states and we have, most people have not visited all 50 states. And there are some beautiful, we have a lot of good places to travel. And I know we always think about internet because I'd be like, oh, let me go international. But there's some really good places here. I haven't been like a lot during the Midwest, you know, so I need to go and travel to, I've never been to Nebraska, like places like that. And that may not seem exciting, but I know there's some beautiful places in all of those destinations. So I definitely agree with that. And I say, even if you want to start off with, um, so I'm in Southern California. So even if I wanted to start off in Northern California, that's an hour by plane, seven hours by car, I can easily get back home or even somewhere uh, like, uh, close to me, like Santa Barbara, that's two hours away. So you can literally start anywhere yeah. um, to kind of, I, you may still be nervous, uh, even if you've done it a couple times, but I feel like that's just a way to start. And I even say lower it down to that. Go to the movies by yourself. Go out to eat by yourself. Oh, that part, that part. You know, once you have conquered that um, societal paradigm, that you have to be with someone when you go to a fine dining experience. Once you conquer that by yourself, you know, you hard pressed to do it with somebody else because you do it when you want to do it, how you want to do it, where you want to do it, right? 
Exactly. That's the empowering part. It's the independence and the freedom that comes with taking yourself out to dinner, taking yourself to that movie, putting your feet up if you want to, laughing out loud when you feel like it. Nobody's looking at you like, really? Was it really that funny? None of that. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I, I know another question that people are going to want to ask is, what about dating as a seasoned solo traveler? What about it, Tiffany? What, <laughs> <laughs> what is the question? <laughs> the question is, what we all want to know is, how does that work? How do you meet people while you're on your solo travels? Do you date? Do you not? Is there a safety factor with that? What do you do in those situations if that's something that you're interested in? Right, right. Um, okay, so to answer the question, yes, I have dated internationally. Um, I dated in Ecuador. I've dated in um, Mexico. I have dated in Panama. Uh, so yes, and, and I think that the same instincts that you use dating in your backyard are simply just amplified when you date internationally. There may be a language barrier, of course. There may be an age difference. Um, I will say being a seasoned solo traveler who does date, I, I entertain men who are younger than I am. Um, and it's not taboo at all. Um, so just open your mind to the possibilities. And I like meeting people organically. I'm not an, a dating app person at all. Okay, you know? that's how I was going to ask you. Like, okay, are you meeting them just kind of out and about? Or you, like you said, you, so you're no on dating apps, uh, but you'd like to meet more of a genuine connection. Absolutely. I like it to be organic. So, uh, you know, I met a man in Ecuador who just happened to come into the clubhouse at the same time I was there. Boom. Um, you know, being an international house sitter, you, you, sometimes you walk a really cute dog. That's a really great way to meet people. Right. That's a conversation. <laughs> to dog, And I'm like, thank you. And then the conversation starts organically. Um, so yes, yes. I, I have found it very easy to date internationally. Do you find that it's easier to date international? Because you know what they say out here, the term that they use now, there's P in the dating pool. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so do you find it easier to date abroad or you feel like it's kind of the same? Well, that's a difficult question because I was married most of my right. adult life. Okay. Um, so dating was completely different for me um, at 58 than it was at 18. Right, right, right. Um, so the whole landscape had changed. Um, but what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> question, uh, now I forgot what the question was. <laughs> I forgot what the question, but let me ask you this. You mentioned the, the language barrier while dating. So how does that work? Are we using our handy dandy Google translator? Or how are we kind of combating that language uh, between the two? Well, we're using our handy dandy um body language, right? Because a <laughs> smile communicates a lot, right? It can be right. welcoming or, you know, if you got stoic face, that means stay away. I'm not interested. You know, we, we smile with our eyes. And so, yeah, that, that's how you break the barrier initially. And then hopefully as you're traveling, you've picked up a few of the uh, regular greetings, you know, so you could say good day or, you know, good evening, that type of thing. And then, yeah, as you get into more um, conversation, you probably will need your Google Translate and they will as well. Um, so it's, it's um, a nice exchange of learning, right? Because you learn a couple of words when they're trying to communicate with you, they learn a few words from you and it's wonderful. They, I was uh, always this example of my aunt and uncle. They're no longer married anymore, but he did not know Spanish mm -hmm. and she did not know English. And I say, well, I guess all they needed was just, um, just the love between the two. I say, kissing don't need a love, don't need a language, right? <laughs> oh, you just, you know, you uh, having a smile does not require you to say anything. It simply says, yes, I am receptive, right? Right. Not necessarily a date, but I'm receptive to you conversation being coming into my space at this point. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Um, but I think that, again, I always say, uh, again, I don't necessarily think age matter, but some people do. So some people, I literally, somebody, it, and these are young people talking, actually. This is not even seasoned people. And somebody was like, well, what if I get to a certain age and nobody wants to date me or blah, blah, blah. And I was like, do you know the statistics of seasoned folks getting married at a later age or just dating in general? So I feel like don't ever let whatever age you are stop you from getting you a boo. Okay, because they, they out there. <laughs> out there. And as I said, you know, other embrace more seasoned women. So I have found in Latin American countries that, you know, age does not become a factor. That's something that's really a very American paradigm um, that we've fallen uh, trap, in trap to. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, whoever, if you got somebody who, uh, can hook you up with a referral, you know, say, Hey, this is a nice person. Y'all have these similar interests. Would you like to meet dinner? Don't cost nobody nothing. Go out for dinner, have a glass of wine. If, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, Hey, maybe you just met a friend. Yeah, and I and I was like, food is cheap, cheaper in other places than it is here out here. So you can go get a, a really nice date. <laughs> in another country that's right. that's right what about what about safety because that's our number one concern am i going to be safe while i'm there so what are some things that you've done to stay safe have you ever felt scared in any situation while you've been abroad um uh, or anything like that um give us some safety tips yeah yeah and i will tell you that i wrote a blog about safety i wrote a blog about personal safety in your new environment. If you're house sitting, you know, um, the, the tools that you should, that I would recommend that you always have with you, um, as you're traveling to secure your perimeter, secure your interior. Um, there are certain, you know, products that I highly recommend that every woman travel with, even if you're going to a hotel by yourself. Um, but dating safety, I think it's just real important that the sister code is intact. Somebody needs to know who you with, so they know the, they will know where to start looking. Where are you going? I need to know where you're going. I need to have an idea of what time you think you're going to be home. Um, this happened to me in Mexico. A very dear sister friend of mine went on a first date, and she ain't tell me nothing. And I'm like panicking for her. She's out having the time of her life, but we didn't adhere <laughs> to the sister code. You know, she was like, oh, it's all good. It's all good. Phone was off. I'm getting, you know, voicemail the entire time that she's on this date, having the time of her life. So we had a real transparent conversation about it when she got home. <laughs> and our group of sisters decided, yes, these are the things that we're going to share with one another so that we can be safe and everybody can feel comfortable in that dating environment. So I think it's real important that you have your sisters around you. Right. No, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Like you said, telling somebody so, you know, knock on wood, nothing happens. But if it does, at least you have a clue to say something. Oh, I know she went out with this person or that person. They met up at this place. She sent me her location. And what do you say, dating aside, what about, um, or tell me, how does your children feel about you going solo? And how do you handle your family when it comes to these conversations about you being all over the world? <laughs> well, luckily, I only have one kid. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have one daughter and one granddaughter. And when I first went to Ecuador, that was my first long-term long uh, solo adventure, like I said. Um, she expected me to be gone 60 days. That was the expectation, that was the plan. And I was a planner, so the plan was just that. When the plan changed, yeah, she was feeling some kind of way, like, wait a minute, you said 60 days, now you're talking about six months, what's going on with you? Um, so we had to have that real, um, that real conversation, like this is what I need in my life right now. Um, so that was kind of challenging, but now she's my biggest advocate. She's like, where are you going? You know, I, I'm here with my granddaughter who reminded me that I'm only the gallivanting grandma because of her. You would only be the gallivanting mommy if it wasn't for me, she said. So shout out to my granddaughter Layla. But those are the two people in my life that I really, you know, have to be 
okay with. They have to be supportive of this lifestyle. And thank God they are because I can involve them to a certain level. You know, with house sitting, I'm doing it for six weeks in Seattle. My granddaughter's with me every day. Oh, okay. So, okay. So I didn't realize that. I guess as long as you let them know that you're having a guest, whether kid or whatever, that um, you just inform the host that that's a happening. It's not that simple. Um, okay. There are sits that are uh, deemed family friendly. Oh, okay. So I, w- I look for those when I know that I want to bring either my daughter, or granddaughter, or both. Um, and then in my profile, I do also say when there's an opportunity and the opportunity um, presents itself, excuse me, sometimes I do bring my granddaughter. And so it's part of my profile. So it's not a surprise when I say, oh, I'm going to bring Layla with me. It's not a surprise. So you manage those expectations so that you don't always have to ask the question. I have my host asking me, are you coming by yourself or is Layla joining you? Okay. okay. So they already know. (laughs) They know. They already know what's going on. Okay. So I like that. Okay. So that's super cool. That's super cool that you can involve your family if necessary. Um, I like that you're still able to involve the most important people right now to you into that lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, my parents are gone. So who am I accountable to at this point in my life? You know, it's about what I need, what I want to be the best person that I can be, which translates, I certainly hope, into being the best mom that I can be and the best grandma. So, you know, it's all about we're going back to full circle to the beginning of our conversation, giving yourself permission to give you what you need to be empowered, successful, happy, at peace, and all around well. That is wonderful. Um, I like that. So tell us any last words that you want to let us know about being a seasoned traveler um, or any other destinations you want to talk about. So any final words um, that you can give, give to our listeners? Thank you so much again for the opportunity. And let me just encourage um, women of color, but particularly my sisters who are season 55 and over, do not let the fact that you haven't done it stop you. I encourage you to get that blue book. If you got it and it's got dust on it, blow the dust off, you know, pick a destination, stick to it, book yourself a flight and get to it. Like you said, just do it. You know, it's never, you're never too old and it's never too late. Absolutely. And so if people are looking for you or want to use any of your services, please let us know where they can find you. Absolutely. So my screen on Facebook, it's Diamond Crystal. Um, on uh, my group on Facebook is The Gallivanting Grandma. Um, and you can also find my YouTube under The Gallivanting Grandma as well as IG. I love that name. (laughs) So we're going to make sure that we have all of your information so that people can contact you if necessary, if they have any more questions. I don't know if you're accepting VA clients or if they just want to transition into that global um, nomad digital lifestyle. Um, This was a great conversation. I'm so happy that you were able to come on, tell us about your experiences and introduce us to something new that a lot of people do not know about. We talk about wellness, sabbatical, healing, grieving, dating, solo Uh traveling. We went all over the place. We got a little bit of everything. And this was just a snippet of the conversation. And I guarantee you, we could probably literally talk all night about any of those topics But I'm so glad that you came on and I look forward to talking to you in the future about other stuff. And I look forward to just kind of seeing where you're at next. Well, thank you again so much. And like I say all the time, I hope to see you somewhere in the world, not on this computer screen, somewhere in the world. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right.